I'd like to uh, give a warm welcome to Heidi and to James from Ripple's Wellbeing, who are going to talk to us today about their journey and how trauma can be turned into a positive um, for both yourself and for other people around you. I think it's really timely that we've got this webinar up and running, and I'm very grateful for um, Ripple's Wellbeing taking the time to do this for us, particularly with Suicide Prevention Week it was just um, last week, and we have all heard about the difficulties people are having. Thanks, Anne. Um, great to e meet you all. Um, but yes, welcome along to today. We are going to present to you and, and talk to you through um, our, our kind of webinar that we've created, which is about creating a positive change through trauma. So just to introduce ourselves. So um, as for my name on, on the screen, my name's Heidi Chapman Mercer. Along with James, I'm the Executive Director of Ripple's Wellbeing Limited. I'm a mental health first aid instructor uh, working for Qualsafe. I'm also a wellbeing man coordinator for a charity called Penny Bron UK. I have a corporate background working in um, board and executive level management, so quite different to what I do now. Um, and yeah, James again is is somewhat different to myself. So James, I'll pass over to you. Okay, thank you, Heidi. Um, yeah, so as you can see on the screen, I'm James Hall. Um, co-director with Heidi, as she mentioned. Um, and my title, which sounds very fancy, is um, I'm an integrative counsellor, which basically um, in layman's terms, if you like, means that I'm trained to use lots of different modalities to, to work with one-to-one -one clients in a counselling setting. Um, very, very different to what I did in a previous life, if you like. Um, I've got 22 years uh, experience in the construction industry as an electrician. So it's very, very different. But as we get into this call um, and or into this kind of webinar, you'll see how things changed for me and how it led me to a path of where we are today. So that's me. I'm also a dad. I'm also an avid rugby fan um, and uh, a chairman of a grassroots rugby club. So I've got quite a lot of sides to my character, I guess you could say. So anyway, without any further ado, off we go. We go. So today we are going to introduce ourselves, which uh, we can tick that box now. So um, hopefully you know a little bit more about James and I. We're going to learn about trauma and how trauma affects mental health, which will lead us into reflecting on James and my story and how trauma can create um, a positive from that trauma. And we're gonna use our lived experiences to demonstrate that. We're then going to lead into a little bit of self-care, some signposting, hints and tips for your toolkit and resources and support. So um, I think from last time, and, and hopefully there's a few quotes in here. So James and I are massive, um, if you follow us on social media, we use quotes a lot. I, th I think they they really sum up sometimes what we're starting to talk about. And, and this is a quote that I really like, which is that I fell apart many times. So what does that say about me besides I live through wars? And I think that really sums up what we're going to talk about. We're going to layer up some knowledge about what trauma is, how it affects us. And then hopefully by sharing some part of our story, will really layer on that, that you, through trauma, um, although it creates huge responses in all sorts of avenues, which James is gonna take you through, it can create some real positive change um, in yourself and those around you. So on that note, I am gonna pass over to James, who's gonna take you through um, some knowledge around trauma. Thanks, Heidi. So, um... As we can see, so trauma, so this is a kind of definition, if you like, so um, a deeply distressing or disturbing experience, an emotional response to a hor horrific event, like an accident, rape or natural disaster, of course, there's lots more. Um, shock and denial are very typical things that kind of happen immediately after. It's, this is not happening, it can't be true. Um, 
and there can be kind of more long-term effects. Um, it, it can have unpredictable um, things happen to our emotions. Um, we get flashbacks. We can have strain on our relationships and people around us and actually also develop some quite physical um, life-changing um, symptoms, actually, that can make us really physically affected. So headaches being an example and nausea too. So you guys, we could sit here and talk at you, but it feels quite boring and a little bit dull. We want to know kind of what do, what do you guys know about trauma? So the very thought of maybe me inviting you to be open here and say this may be traumatic in itself, and that's okay. We respect that. So feel free if anyone feels like they want to say what, what trauma means to them or type in the chat or anything you want to do, just a kind of general broad brush um just your opportunity to to have a bit of a say if anyone wants to have a go over to you guys we don't have to but if anyone's yeah, feeling it's something to do with shock i think trauma mm -hmm. uh, because of its sudden out of the blue and uh, i think it's one of the words that comes to mind okay thank you there are a couple of um words in the chat um, hurt, shame, and pain. Absolutely, yeah. And and shame actually is is very is a, is a real tough one. Um, something I work a lot with in the counselling room. Actually, um, a lot of people tend to to really struggle with coming to terms with shame. And and actually, it's quite um, euphoric when you see people really feel accepted to be able to explore that that shame with me in that therapy room. Um, quite humbling to witness actually and be a part of um, but it's definitely a huge part of trauma anyone else okay so feel free to keep firing them in if something springs to mind you'll see quite a few words appear on the screen um, some of these are symptoms some of them are things that, that happen some of them are events a whole bunch of words that could in a snapshot represent some trauma and here's a whole load more so lots and lots of things you can see some of these things that jump out to us these this abuse this kind of like the flashbacks it's the anxiety ptsd so lots and lots of big big words that that we hear that are pretty pretty scary um scary things to hear um and we will talk about some of these things quite openly um because we've lived and still live, I guess, to a certain degree with some of this trauma um, ourselves. So we will put our hearts on our sleeves. We'll be brave. We'll be vulnerable. I will definitely be because I get pretty choked up when I talk about my stuff. Thankfully, in the therapy room, it's not about me. So I don't get as choked up because it's obviously not about me. Um, so, yeah, so just a... Hi, Anne. You got your hand. Um, we've got a couple of other words that people okay. have, um, response to a terrible event, e.g. an accident, rape or death, and uh, feeling a failure. Absolutely. Yep, yeah, all very close to home, Heidi, would you agree? Very much, very much. And I think the, um, as James was saying, there's trauma is quite broad, actually, and can mean something different to every one of us. But um, yeah, all of those words are really, really good descriptive words the trauma okay quite uh quite basic thing really but who can experience trauma is does it discriminate does trauma pick and choose who who gets traumatized and what's traumatic to person a may not be traumatic to person b so there's no trick question. <laughs> the answer to this really is any, anybody. Anybody can experience trauma and it happens, unfortunately, every single day. Um, but it's, it's what we do with that and how we use that to inform us or inform our personality to bounce back. And hopefully some of our insight will allow you to see how we did it. And there's no right or wrong because people that experience trauma will find their own way. Anyone feeling brave? 
So anyone here that can say, yeah, I've, I've been affected by trauma. Probably a lot of hands. I can't, I can only see a few people on, on the screen, but I would imagine there's, there's probably quite a few hands here. And I just want to sort of say thank you for, for sharing that. And yeah, it, it kind of, it means a lot to us that we can be open and honest because you'll see as we get into this that we really do kind of put our hearts on our sleeve. Okay, so again, just a bit more knowledge stuff. So some of these words that we kind of talked about, so this is sort of emotional and psychological responses. There's a whole list here and many, many more, but just I've just picked a few out at random really that I've highlighted and made slightly bigger. Denial, so that kind of, this isn't happening. The shock kind of, no, doesn't happen. It's not happening, can't be true. Fear, definitely a real kind of scary place to be. For me, this was my, this was my kind of the one that destroyed me, it ripped my soul from my body was the guilt that I felt from the trauma that I went through. That kind of constant comparing yourself to someone else thinking there's people way, way worse off than me. Why do I feel like I do? But I just did. And that made me feel really guilty. Um, again, so traumatic experiences, there's, there's millions, thousands. Um, bullying. I hear it far too often in the therapy room. Childbirth is definitely pretty traumatic. Um, natural disasters. Obviously, there's hundreds of things that we could, we could mention here, but just a few examples uh, here of things that we kind of, that we, we can associate with as experiences. And then, as I alluded to earlier, there's, there's physical responses. So, again, I'm picking out three. That fatigue, that kind of exhaustion, that the racing heart, the sweating, the kind of just almost out of body experiences that, that we face is that in itself is, is really quite scary and traumatic um, to go through. So how does it affect our mental health? So with trauma, there's kind of three main points to trauma really um, if we look at this in its most simplistic form so a single event is described as acute so an acute trauma so it's as an isolated incident where something pretty severe has happened to us and we feel traumatized by that then we go to the chronic um, version of trauma which is a more of a series like a string of People say things come in threes, some of those cliches that you hear, things like that. But that I would say is kind of more chronic. And then of course, we've got complex. Now that is multiple things at different points in your life. It could be things that have happened to you as a child. It could be things that have happened to you as you become an adult. And there could be a whole host of things that you've chosen to to actually try and bury because they're just too awful to try and think about or comprehend. And this is when it starts to get messy is when we, they're all intertwined together. And so you've got, as a, to pluck a number out of the air, we've got 20 items of trauma and they're all molded into one. And they can confuse us because we're not sure which feeling belongs where. And this is what can actually really, really kind of scare us and re-traumatize every single time because we associate trauma A with trauma X and so on. So, so to see that kind of visual image, if you like, very simplistic way of looking at it, but that's what's going on for us. And this is why it has a greater effect on our mental health, the more complex it is. So some of the things for me, and this is, this is very much a, a list of things that that went on for me, definitely. Flashbacks, um, I'll, I'll talk you through my lived experience shortly, but that kind of reliving what happened, the sounds that it made, the smells I associated, the weather, all things that triggered something in my mind to put me back in that place, which every time it happened, I really believed that I was there, which actually at times led me to this panic attack. It led me to a place where you wake up in, in the middle of the night and you can hear the noise that your bones made when they break. 
which is what was going on for me. That sense of panic, that kind of, oh, I, I don't know what to do with myself. I literally cannot function. I cannot even think properly. I cannot sleep. We then got disassociation where we can become numb or detached. So we remove ourselves from, from things that are going on in the world or because it's just, we just it's like this out of body experience because we feel like we lose ourselves and then that kind of the opposite if you like of that which is that hyper arousal where we're very very anxious we're constantly on edge thinking everything's going to go wrong and we almost can will things to go wrong and that sounds quite strange but it actually does happen you start to believe that whatever I do it's going to go wrong because I've had trauma so therefore it's going to it's going to affect me Sleep, I've alluded to it already, massive, massive effect on, on sleep. Um, and when you're tired and you're, you, you become useless, actually, and you, and you feel quite useless when you've got no energy, when you're not getting those, that constant routine of sleep, of course, goes without saying, my self-esteem gets crumbled, gets affected. We kind of want to reach out for help, but sometimes don't know how. We can self-medicate, we can take drugs, we can drink lots more alcohol. These are coping strategies, things that, that I did, that other people have done. Denial, guilt, and even worse, that those suicidal thoughts. And again, close to home, pretty hard to think about now when I look at where and who I am right now, but it was a real thing for me. So, Pretty hard hitting stuff, quite um, quite real, quite. And anyone that's experienced trauma, and many of you have, as you've already said, this will touch nerves for you. This will make you kind of maybe semi relive some of this. And just want you to, if anyone feels that they'd like to do this, again in the chat, unmute yourself, speak up. Just any of these symptoms that you would sort of think they would have the greatest and the least impact on a person's day-to-day -day life and, and any reasons why. And there's no right or wrong because trauma is unique. And like I said, what someone feels is very different to somebody else. But anyone want to have a, have a go at, at saying which one they feel would be the most impactive or least Day-to-day -day living, I suppose, obsessive compulsive disorders because they impact and actually stop you actually living. Mm -hmm. be quite severe impact. The least, Im the least impact is probably bottling up emotions because that's all internal and most people probably wouldn't even notice that as you walk, walk, walk around at work. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And like I said, there's no right or wrong. It, it, some people may think... Oh, that would be horrendous if that was for me, if that was something that I had to live with. But somebody else, they may say, actually, no, that would be more, more tricky for me. Just say something about the quiet and introverted. That's often the girl in a classroom that mm -hmm. gets missed, mm -hmm. um, which is very sad. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so some people do suffer in silence and... And that's actually a lot harder that when, than when you've got someone that's saying, okay, this is it. This is, this is what's going on for me because they're taking ownership of those feelings and they're actually actively seeking help to try and recover from that. And, and I get it in the therapy room. People come in and they want, they want help, but they are so traumatized. They don't even know where to begin. Um, and it's tough. It's, it's such a tricky thing to to kind of build to, but we do, we work and we, that non-judgmental kind of setting and where you truly accept your clients for the people that they are. And you really kind of give them that unconditional therapeutic love and yeah. they can grow and they do. Can I just say, uh, James, that it's Wendy again, sorry, that the lack of concentration and memory lapse, some older people might think they've got dementia and actually it could be more linked to this. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree. Yeah. It's um, like you said, it's sometimes things can manifest in many ways um, and there may be some assumptions made, but 
it's it's about the, I guess the more we kind of make this acceptable accepted that we can openly talk about mental health generally actually but specifically in this case trauma the more we can be there for each other because we all learn every single day and lived experiences and people that can allow others to feel empowered I think probably goes quite a long way to to them being able to maybe reach that place of acceptance himself and for me acceptance is everything so um, without any further ado we're going to go on I'm going to hand over to Heidi who's going to talk you through some stuff about our story specifically so hi um so Maria hopefully you can see the link um, hopefully I've just posted it in there so that's where I was just finding the link um, at the bottom so hopefully you can get that now if there is anything else from anything that James has spoken about um, we can share them we can share them with Anne who can pass them on to you all so we have where James and I really feel that um, where we feel there's lots of things that that we where we as a as a single person as a community as a group of people can make a huge impact on others is if we are willing as James was saying it, it takes a lot and and you know there's no there's no shame as we were talking about earlier on in not being able to do it but where James and I have had training and and lots of growth ourselves you know um I have counselling, not from James. Um, I've had counselling for a very long time. Um, and, and I think where we will share our story with you, some part of our story, really to, to show how to really add um, uh, a kind of realism to what James has just told you about in the theory but also um, to really show you how um, trauma, um, although all-encompassing, can um, turn into a positive um, with, with help and, and with guidance. So um, on the screen there, you'll see lots of things. There's a, James will um, come in and add um, a, an element of his story. So the part I'm going to talk to you about today, which links uh, a few pieces of my story is the, is the bottom left where it says mental health at home. So my um, my mum has um, all of her life um, from a very young age suffered with um, anxiety and depression. So comorbidly at the same time with um, a number of physical health problems which have exasperated as her life has gone on. Um, but where it was a real challenge in my home was one of my earliest memories is of um, being taken to school by um, someone that I don't really remember. And it's one of my earliest memories that um, uh, I have. And actually have to spending um, a lot more time in my latter years with my mum and, and talking to her. Um, that was the first time in my childhood when my mum was admitted to a psychiatric hospital. And actually, as we've pieced the puzzle together, I was four. OK, and that's my earliest memory of that mental health being really present in my life. And, you know, my my mum on a day to day basis had um, a, a lot of the um, things that Jane was James was listing as um, as a symptom of trauma herself. One of the things was OCD behavior. So my mum would she had to check the tap. Um, and it was all number based, um, which I remember as a young child. I remember my mum teaching me how to clean the sink correctly, um, which is a really odd thing to teach a young child. I remember um, every time we would leave the house, it would take a long time. Me and my brother would be waiting at the gate. And my mum would have to check the door and then she checked the door again and again and again and again. And it would it would get to the point where she had a number in her head, which from my mum was 37 and everything had to be done 37 times. So she would check what me and my brother were wearing and she would count the, where she was checking. Um, she checked my brother 37. She checked me. She checked the door. Um, and, and somehow if something in that process broke her train, her, her thought process, she would go back to the beginning and start again. And 
what that did um, to me as a child was it, it came out in, in a lot of ways. And mainly for me, um, it was only, as I said, until later life when I realised that that it, childhood experience of my mum's mental health was really traumatic to me as a young person. And I developed um, OCD tendencies. Um, I also developed a real, um, a real disposition for um, control so wanting control in my life where I felt that um, I was losing it um, through my mum being unwell or, or quite frequently not being in the home and that OCD for me would come out in um, initially um, where you can see there at the bottom of the screen with um, it's a it's an eating disorder which is called PICA which some of you may have heard of may not have heard of and PICA is um, an eating disorder where you eat non-nutritious, um, it's just non-nutritious substances or, or non-nutritious things. So um, I used to eat tissue, um, I used to eat um, mud, I used to eat things that would give no sustenance, but I would, um, it was a behaviour that started when I was very, very young and um, progressed until I was a teenager where actually um, I did spend a short period of time in hospital where I felt so out of control in my life that the only thing I could control as a teenager was what I was eating. Um, and I would have um, really um, quite obsessive that if I if I ate a meal, I would have to run X amount of miles or I'd have to do X amount of activities. Um, and, um, you know, where James was talking about that disassociation. I remember when I was um, a teenager, almost being a, be, having the ability to look at myself as someone in the mirror. I could almost partition myself away from myself and look onto my life. And it felt like it was not really there. And, you know, I used to um, dream about my funeral as a teenager. Um, and I and, and it developed into later life into really kind of self-destructive and quite risky behavior. I put myself in quite um, dangerous, precarious situations as a young female. Um, obviously, you can also happen for young males in situations um, that were very risky and would put myself um, in these dangerous, dangerous situations, but almost intentionally knowing that the risk was there, but almost being kind of quite notulent about what those behaviours could create. Um, I also it reflected in my schoolwork, but in my schoolwork it came out quite differently. So I was having these quite obtrusive um, behaviours in my personal life, but at school I wanted to be the good one. I wanted nobody else to know what was going on. I worked really hard. I was an A-star student. Um, I worked and, and it was a real, one of the symptoms that James says is that um, you, you put a front on, actually. And for me, although I was having all of these things at school, um, I didn't want anybody to know, actually. I worked even harder. I studied harder. Um, on, and I didn't want any of those things to come out. It was only in later life and actually become a mum myself that I started exploring all those things um, in my childhood. So, um Hopefully that gives a little bit of insight into um, how trauma can come out in a young person, particularly. So James and I have quite different um, trauma and, and James and I, and James would, would definitely be open in saying that James and I fit in that, you know, when there were those three bubbles, James and I fit in that complex. Um, if you were going to put us in a bubble, we would, we would both fit in the complex where we've had um, multiple traumas um, which have kind of layered up into something else. So I know that some of those things can be hard to hear. Um, they can hit a personal note. They can, um, that it could be something you can relate to a young person who's in your environment or maybe yourself as a young person. So um, please just be mindful of that. Hope sharing it, it, it enables you to, to, to be able to just be a bit, it kind of, it's more about those symptoms and how, for me, um, that trauma as a very young person came out in that sense. So I'm actually going to pass over to James now. He's going to talk to you and share some of his story in how um, his trauma came out in his life. Thank you, Heidi. Every time I hear Heidi speak, it kind of, 
as you can hear, like things do they do hit me, um, especially when we are as close as, as we are. So it's never easy to hear um, people that you really care about and the things that they've been through, even though you've got your own kind of stuff. So, so for me, um, a, f a few things really. So most of the images on the screen belong to me um, or sort of my journey, if you like. Um, definitely one of them because a picture of me stood there with, sat there with no clothes on. But anyway, we'll talk about that, which I, I hope that won't traumatize too many of you seeing that, but that's my humor for today. Okay, so I've broken the ice. Okay, so onto a serious note. Um, so for me, uh, I could talk quite a lot about context and my upbringing and stuff like that, but I'll summarize massively and say that it's fair to say my childhood was very privileged, um, very lucky and stable. Uh, so things going wrong were hard to take for me. Um, and yes, as you can hear, I do get tricked up. So I make no apologies. I, I can't help. I wear my heart on my sleeve. And I'm like, mom, I guess you'll either love or hate me. And, and that's that. But <laughs> here we are. So one of my best friends was killed in the London bombings in, in the terrorist attacks, um, which was absolutely, as I'm sure you can imagine, absolutely devastating. Um, really kind of a real surreal experience, something that I don't think anyone would ever imagine could happen to us. And maybe that's naive, but it, it just became um, we obviously saw it in the news and, and all of a sudden um, it became very, very close to home when I saw a picture of the front page of The Sun and there was my friend Jenny, a massive picture of her stood next to me because we were previously in a show together where I was playing the part of Joseph when I was a little bit slimmer, I hastened to add, but we were stood kind of in show mode and that they used that photo and it just said missing. Now, at the time I knew that, I knew that Jenny lived where she lived and I knew that she traveled a lot for work, but never once did I ever think she'd be caught up in this, but she was. And for me, that, that was the kind of start of it. Then a massive frenzy happened where her whole family began to panic, obviously, as you would, and there, everyone's out searching for Jenny. And eventually, a few days passed, and we got the confirmation that Jenny was killed in Edgewater Road, um, which was hard. It was, um, there's no, there's no dressing it up. There's no way to kind of, to kind of ever understand how or why or what, what she must have, that panic and of everyone around her at that time. So that for me was kind of this, there's been a few other bits and pieces along the way, but that for me is something that stands out definitely in, in my kind of world, if you like. The, the gravestone you see on there. So obviously we all know it was seven, seven. The gravestone you see, same date, seven, seven. I lost my gran two, two years after we'd lost Jen. So, Again, it was something about that date. It was, it, in fact, there's something about July and around that time that I started to associate things are going to go wrong. And I started to, it started to affect everything about me. It started to affect the way that I was carrying myself, the way that I was kind of, I had my wits about me all the time. I'd been attacked a couple of times, um, got some pretty brutal scars, but that's a whole nother, another animal, if you like. But... <laughs> The, the thing that you see in the middle of the screen or just slightly to the left, that big double-decker bus. So unfortunately, I was that guy that everyone says it could be worse. You could be hit by a bus one day. That was me. So I, I am that person that was hit by one of those things. And I can categorically tell you having your leg run over by something that weighs 12 and a half tonnes is definitely not something that I would recommend. And it was all done in the act of helping somebody else. So I stopped on my way home to help someone. 
with their broken down vehicle so to try and push their vehicle off the road and a double decker bus approached me i turned over my shoulder i looked i saw the double decker bus approaching me so as i leaned on i'm a rugby lad i'm quite a strong guy i've so i'm quite useful with that kind of scrummage position if you like so i'm feeling i can do this that's okay got my wits about me i'm quite road aware i see the bus start to edge out now the bus driver didn't edge out far enough and what happened was my leg was clipped by the wheel and my foot went directly under the full weight of a double decker bus so i actually didn't go down which how i didn't go down i really don't know but i tried to so i was and this is the classic denial stuff so the first thing that comes into my head is i'm not going to be able to play rugby tomorrow as i've just been hit by a double decker bus that's the first thing that came into my head I then tried to put my foot down and my leg basically disintegrated beneath me, followed by me falling into a puddle and screaming like you have never, ever heard before. And when we talk about the, the kind of symptoms or the things that the aftermath, if you like, this is what I was hearing every single day. My bones snapping, sounding like you get in a branch of a tree and snapping it. That's what I could hear every single night. And I was snatched about 20 minutes sleep a night for a long, long time. I was fatigued. I was, I'd lost every ounce of confidence. I didn't want to leave my home. I really took myself to a very, very dark place where I looked at my life options. I thought, and seriously thought very hard about how I could end my life. And it scared me. It, it really did scare me. Um, it, I lost my soul. I felt like I didn't know who I was. I was looking in the mirror and not even recognizing that it was me. I didn't even know who I was looking at because I lost every aspect of me. And that was frightening, I can tell you. I forgot. I, I literally forgot all personal hygiene. I began to not care about anything. I locked myself in a room and stayed there for two and a half weeks before I was kind of frog marched to the doctors. Where thankfully, I was able to get some help. I Lots of complications. Fast forward a few months, and we kind of get to a place where these flashbacks are still going. I'm physically not getting better. And the reason I'm not getting better physically is because mentally I'm not better. So it's 100% connected. And I was very, very lucky to have been picked up by the most amazing counsellor ever when I was going in for my second operation for plastic surgery to have basically my foot reconstructed because I had a huge hole in my foot the size of a tennis ball, which all of my tissues were disintegrated. Now I got picked up by the NHS and saw a counsellor. They referred me to a psychiatrist and I spent some very intense sessions with a psychiatrist, three or four sessions a week, which was hard work. But one day something clicked for me and I began to believe in myself. I came home, I was on crutches, had been for nine months and that session, something changed in my head and I said to my partner who's now my wife I'm going for a run and she was like don't be ridiculous you're on crutches and I said I am going for a run I can do this because I'm mentally I've got this and, and I'm, I'm able to come through this and I can see a light I've got something inside me that is burning and it's going to get me, it's going to make me better. So I did, <laughs> I went for a run. I don't know how, but I did. And it was 200 meters, it wasn't far, but I did it. And it was, for me, that was my, my kind of glimpse. That was my, yes, you've got this. I was told you'd never play rugby again. I was told you'll never be able to do the things that you love again. But no, what it did is it taught me to become stubborn. It taught me to say, do you know what? I'm actually not afraid of my shadow because I've seen my shadow and that's what I call it, the dark side of my personality. I've seen it in a different light and I have strength and self-belief to be able to overcome this. So I did. I went back, I rugby trained. 
I went back, I played rugby and I continued to play rugby until another accident, another injury happened, which was too much. It was a neck. So, okay, but it got me to a place where I was happy. I had family by this point, I had children, married. I was in a different place mentally. So that was, that was all good. I also embarked on a retraining journey where I, because I'd learned so much about me with initially with the counsellor, I thought, you know what? Something in this, something in the power of being able to be free, to be able to talk. And I retrained, I became a counsellor and that bit comes next. Just to throw a bit of a spanner in the works, and it was quite a spanner actually, it was, um, so lockdown happening, I'm out on my bike, quite a fit and active bike, although I'm a big lad, quite fit and active. A hundred mile bike ride is not something I do every day, but I, I've been known to do some quite challenging rides. And I was out into a ride, and 25 miles in, I get this horrendous pain that I couldn't really describe. It was it was definitely on a par with the with the bus, but I couldn't really describe what it was, where it was, and what was going on for me. So I don't know how to this day. I still don't know how, but I got home. Seven miles from my home, I cycled home. How I really do not know. And the next thing I know, there's an ambulance on its way. So I'm having probably one of the biggest heart attacks uh, that, that you can have. And I'm very lucky to be here to live to tell the tale. But 45 minutes later, I'm in the BRI having heart surgery. Um, and this for me is how trauma can inform you and allow you to be positive. Because what I did was I relived all that bus accident all over again. I relived some of that, that terror attack that went through and some of those emotions that I've been through. And I was actually able to say, do you know what? I've been through something like this. I've seen this before. I remember what my shadow did to me. And there is no way on this earth I'm going to allow this to consume me or dictate my life. And so I laid in my hospital bed 12 hours after having a major heart attack and said, okay, three months today, I will cycle a 50-mile bike ride in the shape of a heart. And I did. <laughs> Me and 25 other guys, we went out on the bikes. We did the 50 miles, the shape of a heart, and we raised five and a half thousand pounds for the British Heart Foundation. So that, for me, and I'm going to bring this to a bit of a close of this part, that is how my trauma, it could have shaped and defined me, but actually it allowed me to learn. So some of the stuff I went through previously, I was able to, re to bring in some of those skills, some of the techniques that I'd learned. And then I was able to kind of put it back into practice and come back fighting stronger than ever. And I then decided, okay, now your heart is telling you, you need to do something with your life and your job. And so I'll leave you with that kind of little bit there because we will reveal the next bit. So as Heidi said earlier on, we do love quotes. Um, so trauma creates change, you don't choose. Healing is about creating change you do choose. And I hope that my story, Heidi's story, can be a bit of an inspiration or a bit, something to stir up something in, in some of you guys, or hopefully all of you guys. Hopefully it doesn't hit you too hard, but hopefully it touches you in a way where you feel, well, yeah, we, we can do this. And you know what? And it's not about my story is better than yours. It's definitely not that because... As we said before, trauma is so unique and everyone's trauma is a trauma. So I'm gonna hand over to Heidi, who's gonna say about what next. Yeah, so thank you, James. Um, I think it's very powerful and very brave of you to share emotions and to open yourself up to vulnerability. So um, thank you, you know, gets me every time. So what is on the screen now is what James and I, um, who we are. And I like to um, 
I don't know how many, I don't know if everybody's seen Shrek um, and when he compares himself to an onion, like that analogy, um, that I think um, as, a per, as a person, you add layers onto yourself and, and you, you never undo that bit that's the beginning of you, but you add other pieces. And James and I came together through the world of rugby, which you can read more about on our website. And we embarked on through James's story that I was part of through knowing his um, his wife, who I played rugby with, to knowing that James was embarking on his counselling journey. And, and um, we started Ripple's Wellbeing in its infancy and where we've taken our personal trauma, um, that personal desire to want to continue the conversations about mental health to get people talking about mental health we launch ripples well-being in its entirety so we offer counseling mental health first aid training workplace well-being keynote and event speaking and um what we really hope um we we do um our, our kind of ambition is to reflect so reflect on where you are where you've been to empower individuals to share their stories talk about their stories grow within their stories um, and really grow into that next phase. And um, James and I um, are very aware of our, of our past, of our of our layers of our onions uh, that have added to where we are now. Um, and and they never really go away, and they don't. But um, we share our story and our experiences along with um, kind of uh, education and some training to really hopefully um, share um, how things like trauma can become something that's quite positive and, and and where a lot of my trauma was based in my childhood um and and as I was growing up um, I buried it deep really really deep and it was only when I had children later in life where um my mum had another episode in in later life where I really said actually do you know what I, I need to do something about me and what I'm having to in order to not pass that on to my children um, to to really help grow there um, from there so um just on that note um really uh, just to talk about self-care you know from you can't pour from an empty cup take care of yourself first and this is james something that james and i talk about a lot um, you know really make sure that after today after what we've spoken about if it does trigger anything in yourself trigger anything where you can think about someone you know or in your family unit or yourself personally make sure um, you take a little bit of care for yourself before you go trying to help somebody else um, we always say it's a really good exercise is to be able to know your own triggers know where you are on your thermometer am i in a you know to take a Think about yourself and think, am I in a good place? Am I in a good mental health um, spot? Am I in a, in a poor mental health spot? Um, you know, and it's really good to be able to recognise where you are and, and to learn over time the things that can help you move around in that spot. You know, if you are in a poor mental health, um, I like gardening. Um, I love gardening. I like the escapism that it gives me. I know that when I stop and check myself, I think... Uh, yeah I'm, I'm dipping on my I'm dipping on my thermometer I'm probably dipping into a poor mental health space so I need to take some self-care some time for myself that reflective space um to bring myself back um I think James if you that's this is where we're talking about it if you pop forward another one yeah it's just about always taking care of yourself knowing your limits, um, knowing your triggers and thinking about things that can help those triggers. And just a little bit about signposting. So conscious of your time. So um, just remember, you know, as a mental health first aid or as a mental health advocate or someone who is around somebody who may be experiencing trauma or had experienced trauma, um, we're not, nobody's qualified to diagnose or suggest treatments unless we're medical professionals. Um, so the best thing we can do is to be aware of what, what is called signposting, which means informing people um, about where they can get help and information from. So one of our biggest pieces of advice is, is to know what exists in your area, um, as simple as, you know, um, being aware of Samaritans, being aware of the equivalent to Samaritans in the country where you live, um, that if somebody, you know, you, you can't 
you can't diagnose or suggest treatments, but you can help them to get help um, from professionals. Um, and just for we, uh, you know, and don't be afraid to say no. Um, trauma is not to be messed with. Um, make sure you seek that professional help. Um, and just to end, before we open up for question for any Q and A, um, it's just these resources, which again we'll pass on to Anne to share with you. Um, these are obviously UK based, um, but Mind Samaritans Assist Trauma Care, which is a really really good one, um, which is for specialist help for people who've experienced trauma or supporting someone who is or has. Um, Again, next page, there's some apps, which are really helpful and really useful. Again, we'll share these with Anne um, for you. And lastly, just before we open up for, um, there's no timestamp on trauma. There isn't a formula that you can insert yourself into to get from horror to healed. Be patient, take up space, and let your journey be the balm. And I think that's a really good space to end on that.